Hello students, this is Professor Del Russo and the following is my on-campus lecture from February 9, 2015. During the lecture you will see there was some uncertainty about the number of deliberating jurors in a civil action and I had asked students to research that issue and get back to me and it turns out that Kimberly Brown correctly pointed us to uh, New Jersey Rule 1 colon 8-2 and as we all know there are 12 jurors in a criminal case that the 12 jurors verdict has to be unanimous in a criminal case either guilty or not guilty and if there is anything less than unanimity if one or two jurors or more don't believe that a person's guilty or not guilty the judge can declare what's called a mistrial and the prosecutor has the option of trying the case over again that does not offend and does not violate the constitutional rules prohibiting double jeopardy because there was no verdict there was no outcome so a criminal jury again requires 12 jurors often 14 or 16 are seated in case a juror gets sick or something like that happens but with regard to civil actions in New Jersey the common number of jurors is six six and five of the six have to agree in order to reach a verdict, whether there's civil liability or not, or whatever issues are before the civil jury. Remember, civil juries decide actions which can result in a monetary verdict, uh, whereby private parties are suing one another or a private party suing an institution or corporation, and the possible outcome is a monetary reward or award uh, that will make them whole again for whatever losses they suffered. So you need six jurors. The law says that you can have as many as 12 jurors. And interestingly, I was sitting next to a civil litigator at a recent scene hall basketball game, and I questioned him about juror numbers, and he said he's never had a case where there were a dozen jurors, uh, and he's not heard of one, although the law allows it. So it is very rare to have 12 jurors. If there is a case where the court permits, you have to ask the court's permission. If there is a case where the court permits 12 deliberating jurors in a civil case, then 10 jurors have to agree out of the 12 as to the outcome. So 5 of 6 or 10 of 12, and in the criminal courts, the verdict must be unanimous. Now, there was a section on matrimonial law, which I eliminated from the lecture. I'm going to create a mini podcast that addresses matrimonial law to the extent that you need to know matrimonial law for our class children and just it's going to be a brief overview of matrimonial law and I cut that out and I will be making a separate podcast on that issue as well and lastly I spend some time talking about the burdens of proof in the civil courts the family courts and the criminal courts and what I did was include a clip from Lauren Carlton, who is a recently retired assistant attorney general who represented throughout most of her career uh, the Division of Child Protection and Permanency. Uh, she represented them before the appellate division and the Supreme Court on multiple occasions, and I thought it would give you students a different perspective on burdens of proof. So the lecture will begin in a moment with Professor Myers on the adversary system of justice. And Myers uh, talks about the adversary system of justice there. Now, whether you're in a family court, whether you're in criminal court, whether you're in the civil courts, whether you're in courts of chancery or equity or patent court or admiralty court or wherever you are in America, we operate under what's called the adversarial system of justice. Okay? And essentially what happens is two lawyers, two lawyers, and sometimes many more than two lawyers, uh, will advocate for the interests of their clients. Uh, they will have their pers uh, their uh, prospective uh, uh, positions. They'll have their uh, uh, specific positions about their uh, client's case. Um, and everybody kind of has a client anyway, um, uh, whether they be private litigants or government uh, attorneys and the like. They will advocate for their position. Uh, the other side will advocate for their position, and either a jury or a judge uh, will make decisions upon the facts. And the, the, the thought is there that this clash of adversaries will lead us to the truth. And the rules of ethics and the way the justice system is set up in New Jersey and throughout the United States of America operates a little bit differently in, in other countries and significantly differently in, in, in a few countries around the world. Uh, but the thought is 
uh, that this kind of litigation, where disputes between individuals or individuals and government are um, resolved through an adversarial system, uh, that this is the best way for the truth uh, to emerge, that you have a judge or a jury sifting through the evidence that's presented forcefully uh, by each side. Again, the idea is that each side will uh, forcefully and powerfully and diligently advocate for their side, um, and their adversary will forcefully dil and diligently uh, argue for their side, and that this clash of, uh, um, uh, of attorneys and of facts and of law will, will result in um, uh, the truth. Now, who, who decides the truth? Well, that's the judge or the jury, right? The judge or the jury. Uh, they're the deciders of the facts. I talked about this last week when I talked about how uh, the trial system works. I was specifically trying to uh, share with you how the appellate divisions work in the federal courts and the uh, state courts. That is, at the trial court level, uh, the judge or the jury decides the facts. The appellate courts, they don't get into the facts. They get into whether mistakes were made in the trial courts, whether evidence was let in that shouldn't be let in, or whether the court prevented evidence from being admitted that should have been admitted. And I discussed that in some detail with you last week, and it's on the, uh, the recording of my lecture. Well, I'm bringing this up again because I want to focus on who decides the facts. Well, the judge decides the facts in family court. Uh, the judge decides the facts in juvenile court. We'll talk more about juvenile court later. Um, the judge decides the facts in matrimonial court. You used to be able to get a jury trial in matrimonial court. I don't think you can get a jury trial anymore. I don't think so. But I have to double check that. I think that if you are litigating in the family court, the judge is going to make the decision um, as well. Pretty much it's the criminal system and the civil system um, uh, that has jury trials. Uh, civil litigation where you have um, negligence and uh, those civil cases where uh, the remedy uh, is uh, money damages. Uh, they have jury trials. Um, somebody sues someone in a car accident. Somebody sues a, an entity for negligence like a hospital. Um, or a doctor um, that would wind up in civil court, there would be a jury trial there as well. It doesn't have to be. I'll address that in a moment. But you can get a jury trial um, in the civil courts where the remedy, where what you want to happen if you're the sewer, the person suing, is money damages. And there's dozens of different ways, hundreds of different ways you might wind up in the civil courts. Some of the common ones are, you know, medical malpractice, um, or um, uh, automobile accidents, slip and falls, negligence. A lot of the work of the civil courts is negligence, whether a doctor's negligent or, you know, uh, ShopRite is negligent or some other institution or entity is negligent is the issue that the jury's going to decide. And because they were negligent, someone was injured in some way. And I use that term injury broadly. It's not only physical injury. It could be mental anguish. Um, it could be um, lost wages. It could be the loss of your car. Um, uh, that we use broadly. We use the term injury broadly to describe uh, those kinds of injuries as well. We call them economic injury, right? Uh, so if the uh, roads uh, leaving Montclair State coming out of the parking deck weren't properly salted, you know, and your car slid and you hit a pole and you damaged the front end of your car, the engine, and the frame, well, that's going to cost a lot of money. That would be an economic injury. Um, and the word economic is important because you can, you can remedy, uh, you can make yourself whole uh, through the money. Uh, at the end of the day, if you win a lawsuit against Montclair State and the company that they subcontract with to drop the salt and maybe the manufacturer of the salt because the salt wouldn't have enough chemicals in it to make it properly uh, 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 safe, uh, you might sue all those people. Um, and... You would sue them so that they would make you whole again. They would pay for the damage to your vehicle. And if you got hurt, uh, you had to go to the doctor, you had to go to a chiropractor, you had to go to an orthopedist. Uh, all of those kind of injuries uh, would be recognized as well if you prevail. Um, those are economic injuries and physical injuries. Your hurt back is a physical injury. The damage to your car is an economic injury. Uh, both of them you can uh, sue for in civil court. Um, and back to jury judge trial, 
uh, you can get a jury trial. Uh, the difference in the civil case is the jury does not have to be unanimous. Okay? And uh, if somebody will post in the cyber cafe between now and next week what the um, uh, numbers are in the jury's decision in the civil courts for uh, a negligence action, uh, we will learn something, and I'll share it with you next week. You won't get any bonus points, but I will praise you next week for giving us the answer. I know this, though. It's not unanimous. And in that same, if some of you are industrious enough that you will do this for me and go online and figure it out, in a civil case involving negligence in New Jersey in a jury trial, how many jurors have to agree for the plaintiff to win? The plaintiff is you, the car owner who's suing. The defendants, Montclair State, in my little hypothetical, the salt company, the subcontractor who owns the salting truck, right? They're defendants because you say, my car got messed up and my back hurts because of your negligence. So I'm what they call the plaintiff. I'm suing my hypothetical, Montclair State, the truck company that spreads the salt and the manufacturer of the salt. They're the defendants. So when we put all our evidence in, how many jurors sit on a civil case? You need six jurors, nine jurors, 12 jurors, or more. I don't know. I don't even know the answer. My, my background's in criminal law. I can look it up during a break and get you the answer, but I want you to figure it out. How many jurors, right, listen to the case? How many jurors have to decide in your favor? We'll all assume we're the person whose car got smashed and back hurt. How many jurors have to agree for us to collect? to get damages, to get the money back for our back and for our car. Um, and post it in a cyber cafe. And, um, you know, I will acknowledge you next week uh, here in person as well as online. And you will be well known even among my colleagues uh, and the other students in the online course. Now, in a criminal trial, I'll tell you the answer to that. There's 12 jurors. Twelve jurors. And alternates, yeah. And alternates. Thank you, Adela. They're not always two alternates, though, but uh, commonly there's two alternates. But let's just focus on deliberating and decision-making jurors. At the end of the day, twelve jurors in a criminal case decide the case. And their verdict must be unanimous. unanimous. Everyone has to agree. That's not the case in the civil system not the case. And you're going to tell me exactly what the rules are, because the Russo doesn't know them either. And we'll figure that out next week. But it's something less than unanimous. And I'm pretty sure you don't need 12 jurors. I'm, in fact, you don't need 12 jurors. It's something less than that. It's nine or six. Um, but we'll learn that next week. Uh, the point is, is that they're the fact finder. The jury's going to decide whether the um, uh, university was negligent in the spreading of the salt, whether the uh, manufacturer... Uh, whether the, the um, company that subcontracts to spread the salt uh, is um, negligent, and uh, whether um, the manufacturer of the salt beads themselves, the salt itself, are somewhat, somehow negligent as well. You'll also see that in the area of negligence, you have something called contribution. Maybe they're all a little bit responsible for your car sliding on the roadway and crashing into the pole and your back hurts and your front end is all damaged. Maybe Montclair State didn't get there in a sufficient amount of time for the salt to melt the ice. Maybe the company that spreads the salt and subcontracts and sends their trucks around was a little late in spreading the salt and they were negligent. Maybe the company that manufactures the salt didn't use the right chemical composition, therefore the salt didn't melt the ice in a sufficient amount of time based upon the directions on the bag of salt. So the jury can allocate responsibility among all three defendants. They call that contributory negligence, like the word contribution. So at the end of the day, you just care that your car gets fixed and somebody pays the chiropractor and the orthopedist, right? You don't care who pays it, as long as it gets paid. Nevertheless, the people who got to pay, they care. So Montclair State could be 75% responsible, the truck that spreads it could be 20% responsible, and the people who make the salt could be 5% responsible. Um, 
and then they would pay damages, the money that the plaintiff is awarded, okay, to make them whole again, to address uh, the, um, the injury, or, um, are called damages. The money that gets paid is called damages. Now, we're talking about children in the justice system. We're talking about child maltreatment. Do you know that there's a cause of action in New Jersey for child sexual abuse? And the problem is there's very rarely um, someone to pay damages. But a child who's sexually abused by her stepfather or sexually abused, you're more likely to get damages here in a foster placement. Okay. DCPMP can wind up as the defendant if a child is sexually abused by a foster parent. Okay? That would be civil litigation. That is the equivalent, the functional equivalent. It is uh, very similar in kind to the accident I just described. It would be an issue of negligence. The division would be a defendant, right? Um, let's say the division hired a private um, background check company. Right? The division contracts with ABCD background check company. Well, they might wind up a defendant as well. I used a car crash uh, in a child sexual abuse case. There is a civil cause of action where the victim, um, and if she's a minor or he's a minor, uh, the caregiver or someone who has responsibility for the care of this child um, <clears throat> or someone who is the appropriate plaintiff can sue and uh, the issue again would be uh, one of negligence, uh, what the damages are. And in those situations, you get into mental health damages. But again, the theory is they're compensable, that it has value. Uh, certainly, if a child has to see a clinician for many years, uh, that costs something, right? That's something that you could put a price tag on, sadly. Um, and, um, and there's also a price for... Uh, the psychological impact, the pain and suffering, the emotional distress. You know, all of that is considered compensable. Um, the same as the front end of your car, uh, the emotional trauma a child might suffer. Uh, similarly, a child who is <clears throat> a victim of physical abuse uh, can sue, or representatives of the child can sue, uh, for assault. Uh, these uh, um, typically criminal offenses are also offenses which can uh, be litigated uh, for money damages in the civil courts as well. And um, there, the judge is the fact finder or the jury, and more often than not, it's the jury, and there has to be a some kind of majority of jurors who agree. The burden of proof, you'll hear a lot about burdens of proof throughout this class. The burden of proof is what we call in the civil courts preponderance of the evidence. I will revisit this in a moment when I t touch upon civil litigation in the family court in a DCPMP case. Excuse me. And that means the plaintiff, the person who sued, whether it be you who crashed your car or uh, the child who was sexually abused by a foster parent, has to prove the case by a preponderance of the evidence. That's the instruction for the jury. And that means a little bit more than half. 51%. Preponderance. If you look up the word preponderance, it's a conjugation of, I think, pre preponderate. I have to look that up. Um, but preponderance means the bulk of, a little bit more of, uh, most of. most, A little bit more of the evidence um, convinces us that the university is liable or that the division is liable or the, or the foster parents liable. In my example of the child sexual abuse in foster care, you can have contributory negligence there as well. Let's not forget, in my little hypothetical, the foster parents, the one who molested, the division didn't molest anybody, um, but the suit would be against the division for negligence and that same suit would sue the perpetrator as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, generally speaking, it's very hard to get money from the perpetrator. Uh, the division, a lot easier. Um, but the um, plaintiff in those cases would have to prove a little bit more than half, 51%, that the 
division or that the uh, university and the salt company are responsible that they were negligent. It's quite different from the criminal justice system. Someone tell me what the burden of proof is in the criminal justice system. Right, right. What's that? Oh, 80. Well, maybe 80. I don't know. Um, you got to be careful with numbers. Uh, even though we like to say 51% with preponderance of the evidence, there are no real numbers. Um, the uh, exact meaning of these phrases are elusive, is what the courts typically say. The definition of preponderance and beyond a reasonable doubt is elusive. You know, it's really hard to quantify it except to look at the burdens of proof in relation to each other. And I think I might have mentioned them last week. Did I talk about clear and convincing evidence in TPR guardianship cases? No? In any event, so let's just focus on the civil negligence case. It's preponderance of the evidence. So that's a little bit more than half. Just a smidge more than half. You know, we say 51% because that's, that's a way to think about half, right? 51, 49 um, but these are not mathematical equations, far from it. Um, jurors apply them, and they listen to the judge's instruction, and they try to approximate what they believe preponderance of the evidence means. Um, but one way to think about it is a little bit more than, a little bit more than half. Um, and in a criminal case, as you just uh, offered, it is beyond a reasonable doubt. And, you know, uh, when I talk about, if you listen to my PowerPoint on... Um, the criminal justice system, it's in the next learning module. Uh, I don't have it here now. Um, I describe in some detail what beyond a reasonable doubt is. And in fact, I recite for you the jury instruction, what the judge is going to tell the jurors in a criminal case. Something like, it's, you don't have to be certain. Okay, Certainty is not required. But you have to be morally convinced. You know, what does all this mean, really? But uh, the judge tries hard to communicate that. You have to be have the firm belief that the person did it. Um, and, uh, you know, that can be the difference between someone being convicted or someone going free. Uh, the burden of proof uh, is a critical aspect of the adversarial system of justice and litigation in America. And the best way to think of it is in contrasting the burdens of proof next to one another. In a negligence case, it's just a little bit more than half. In a reasonable doubt case, and I've seen hundreds of lawyers do this, they raise their hands like this. And for those of you listening on online, you know, I have one hand pointed towards the ceiling and the other hand pointed towards the floor, and they're about, uh, you know, two feet apart. Whereas uh, preponderance of the evidence um, is uh, about, uh, you know, a half inch apart on the scales of justice. So we know that beyond a reasonable doubt is a lot more than preponderance of the evidence. Somewhere in the middle is something called clear and convincing evidence. And in the family courts, there's a number of different kinds of litigation. Um, and I'll tr talk a little bit about that tonight, I think. But you have your initial filing, uh, and then you have your trial, or what they call a fact-finding. You also have permanency hearings, uh, and you also have sometimes... Uh, Guardianship proceedings are also referred to as what? What are the initials? TP? TPRs, yeah, TPRs, Termination of Parental Rights. In those TPR cases, the burden of proof is not preponderance. It's not a criminal case, so it's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's clear and convincing evidence. What the heck is that? How many percent is that, Adela asks me? I don't know. There's no, there's no, that's why you can't get into percentages, but, um, if we could, let's say 51% for preponderance, let's say 90%, well, even more, let's say 95%, <laughs> which is very misleading. That's why I but don't it's like it. But just to compare them, let's say 95% for criminal, clear and convincing is uh, 80%. <laughs> Again, they, percentages don't fit neatly at all. What does fit neatly, I think, is you got your preponderance, you got your reasonable doubt, somewhere in the middle, not the middle, somewhere between them is uh, clear and convincing evidence. Um, so it's more than a preponderance, but less than a reasonable doubt, clear and convincing evidence. And you know what? The message is, if we can call it a message, that this is serious stuff, right? All litigation, except TPRs, within the family court, involving child protection have a preponderance standard or less.
At this point, class, I have included a clip from a recent workshop conducted by Professor Lauren Carlton. She is a recently retired assistant attorney general and spent most of her career representing DIFUS in the appellate courts and before the Supreme Court. And she's going to offer you a little different take, a little different perspective on the burden of proof. The other thing I mentioned is the standard of proof, which is a slightly different tool. How strong do your proofs have to be? Well, it depends on how big a right I am taking away from you. That's the third part of the due process test. If the government wants to lock you up, they are basically taking your life away, and they have to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Have you heard that phrase? Yeah, everybody knows the criminal stuff. It's so easy. That's why you're taking classes in the child welfare stuff, so you can learn the rest. So beyond a reasonable doubt, and the government has the burden of proof, and some of the jury instructions, and, and Joe's going to correct me if I'm wrong, and Chris, um, sorry, Professor Reed and Professor <laughs> Del Riso, and um, the, the government puts on its case, and the jury goes, oh my gosh, that sounds terrible. But then the defense comes in. And the defense doesn't have to prove that the defendant is innocent. It only has to create reasonable doubt. Could something else reasonably have explained what happened here? And the government has the burden, and the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. Because what we're taking away from the defendant is his life. So that's a really, really important interest. And I'm a parent, so I don't necessarily agree with this, but in the United States, we seem to think that that is the most important right that people have. Personally, termination of my parent parental rights to my girls, that might be the parental death penalty. But in the United States, that requires a lesser burden of proof. And I can explain why. If you want to take custody away from a parent temporarily, you're paranoid schizophrenic. You don't always take your meds. But you have a history of taking your meds and then not regularly taking your meds. And we need to give you time to stabilize. Maybe your meds side effects would support a change in the medication regimen. So they change the medication regimen and you get your kid back. That's the hope. So what I'm asking for as the government is the temporary right to take care of your child while we get you stabilized. And that's a very important right, but your child has a contravailing right to be safe. So in the balance of parents' right to the child, child's right to safety, the burden of proof is still on the government, but the standard of proof is called preponderance of the evidence. And that means that as the government, I don't have to show that it's beyond a reasonable doubt that your child's unsafe. I only have to show it's 51 to 49 and I'm the 51. It's just more than half. So there's a middle tier for when I, the government, want to take your child away from you permanently and free the child for adoption. And that's called clear and convincing evidence. There's no great way that I can explain that, except that it's in the middle. The evidence has to be so satisfying that you really are convinced. It's more than 51%, but it's not quite beyond a reasonable doubt. And the reason it's in the middle is because the interest of the parent that's being taken away is in the middle. We're not going to lock you up or execute you, but we're not going to, we're trying not to give you back your child ever. So we're going to prove our case clearly and convincingly. And the standard of proof is therefore an important justice tool that without it would create a much less probability of a fair outcome. So to rewind a little bit back to Professor Myers, the, um, the first uh, thing that he talks about is the adversary system of justice, whether it be the civil car crash, uh, whether it be the uh, plaintiff who's suing for child sexual abuse. Oh, Professor Del Russo, the following is an excerpt 
of a lecture that I delivered on February. Okay. Whatever court you're in, family court, initial filing, well, not the initial filing because you don't always have the adversaries in court on that first day at least. Um, uh, the expectation is is that each side will present evidence that's most favorable to their position and uh, let a neutral fact finder decide uh, what happened. And it can be <clears throat> a judge or a jury. In the civil courts, uh, most of the time it's a jury in civil negligence cases and in the civil courts. In the family courts, it's almost always, if not always, a judge. Uh, in the juvenile courts, it's always a judge. In the matrimonial courts, it's always a judge. Uh, in the criminal courts, it's almost always a jury. However, did you know that the defendant can ask for a bench trial in the criminal courts? Someone is accused of a crime. A crime in New Jersey doesn't have to have a jury trial. They can have a judge trial. The judge decides the facts, just like the jury would. One person jury, the judge. The judge. Does that conflict with the Constitution, the right to uh, try to uh, jury? Well, you have a right to a trial by jury, and no one's impinging upon that right. The person who chooses the judge trial has a right to a jury trial, so that constitutional right is preserved. That's a good question, though. Because if we said, no, you can't have a jury trial in this class of cases, or because, you know, you were born before 1970 or whatever, some arbitrary reason, you get a judge trial, uh, then we would, you're right, that would be a constitutional violation, and the defendant can sue in federal or state court in that situation and argue that he has a right to a jury trial and you haven't given him a jury trial. But... <clears throat> um, Think about it for a second, Abraham. If you ask for a judge trial and the court gives it to you, has your right to a jury trial been offended in any way? They says to you, Abraham, you, uh, you can have a jury trial or a judge trial. Which one you want? And you say judge trial. Did you have a right to a jury trial in that situation? Yeah, because I offered it to you. You turned it down. So the answer is there's no constitutional violation. Um... If that decision was your decision, right? if it was someone else's decision, now what happens sometimes is you go in a judge trial and you lose. Then you say, well, I really wanted a jury trial, but my lawyer pressured me. I, 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 you know, I fell out of bed that day. I wasn't thinking clearly. I didn't understand what the judge was saying. I thought I had a... You know, there's a million ways to litigate these things and, and argue that somehow your constitutional bias, your constitutional rights were offended in some way, but the mere fact that you got a judge trial instead of a jury trial, if it was your free and voluntary decision, it's okay in New Jersey. And Could that be challenged through, like, for example, your lawyer, uh, let's say you agree with your lawyer to go for that, and your lawyer goes and speaks on behalf of you, but later on you find out that, hey, the way the case is going is not right, and even you marry with your lawyer, you got rid of your lawyer, and now you want to change that decision on the basis that you didn't make it voluntarily <clears> support, it was someone who represented you, but now you want to claim your constitutional right that um, you didn't make it verbally that you don't want to try it. So can you use that as a ground to get your jury trial tried? Well, yes, you can argue at any time uh, that your decision on going with the judge trial instead of a jury trial was not informed and voluntary at any time. And if, like, in the middle of the case, and you're saying, you're looking at it as, can a clever defendant see which way the wind's blowing? <laughs> and in the middle of the trial, or the end of the trial, say, you know what, I, I, now that I thought about this, I never wanted this to begin with, and whatever, fill in the blank. My lawyer coerced me, I was on medication that day, uh, you know, I was whatever. Yeah, you can enforce your rights at any time. Uh, you might as well wait till the case is over. Maybe you'll be acquitted. <laughs> and then you can lie. Um, wow. I mean, if that, if, that, if that really happened, then you certainly have a right to make that argument at any time. Um, and and an, an ethical way would be to do it the moment that you realize it, not wait till the outcome. Um, but an unethical guy might wait to see what the outcome is. 
I think the important thing to realize is, is in the criminal courts, you have a right, you can, you can have a bench trial. They call it a bench trial or a judge trial. And sometimes the joke among lawyers in the hallway is, if, if you are, um, um, if you are, and this really says something uh, about faith in the average 12 people on a jury. If, if you're guilty, go with a jury. Right? If you're not guilty, go with a judge. And nobody follows that uh, almost always. Uh, I don't think I ever had a bench trial, and I tried dozens and dozens of cases. Uh, um, some prosecutors who work for 25 years might go hundreds of cases. Nobody tried hundreds of cases in 20 years. A hundred, so I might have tried a hundred cases if I ever counted them, like from start to finish. Um, but having tried dozens of cases and watched hundreds, if not thousands of cases in many years, I, I, I can count on my hands the number of bench trials or judge trials that I saw. Almost everyone goes with a judge trial, a jury trial. Um, however, you know, the, the joke is really a reflection of our lack of um, belief in the jury system and in jurors that they are easily persuaded, I guess. Um, so if you're, you know, you're really guilty, go with the jury because you can kind of pull, you know, you can kind of pull the wool over their eyes. You can make it look like you're innocent. But if you're innocent, you're really innocent. You don't want to put your life in the hands of 12 people. Say, county, don't know anything about anything. You didn't do it. I mean, it's too easy to pull the wool over their eyes. So give me a judge, man, who listens closely and understands and, you know. Now, having said that, that's the joke, and it's obviously a rather cynical approach. But if you want to look at legitimate reasons to take a judge trial, if it's a highly technical case that involves issues of, let's say, engineering or something, or uh, uh, significant ethical issues, like official misconduct involves ethical issues and administrative rules and regulations, and whether you follow them or not, if it is a highly sophisticated prosecution and it requires... Uh, the utmost attention and precision of the jury, you might want to go with a judge who's, you know, experienced uh, and listens to hundreds of cases and and can separate um, what's important, what's not important. Um, so if you got a highly technical case, let's say an engineer is criminally charged for the design, uh, architectural design of a bridge, and people perished because the bridge collapsed and they died. And some, and they file, a prosecutor files a criminal case against that engineer. You know, if the outcome's in a turn on vague engineering principles, you might want a, one person who's highly educated decide your case rather than have 12 people who just get lost in the emotions of everyone who perished because their car went off the bridge and people drowned. The only thing that would, you know, arguably would be impactful on that jury is the terrible consequence. And when it comes to figuring out the numbers and all that kind of stuff, whatever it is that leads to the criminal, possible criminal responsibility for the engineer, uh, would get lost in the jury's emotions about the outcome. So, you know, we have a highly technical case with an emotional um, aspect to it. You might want to go with a judge trial. Anyway, I'm overstating it here. It's, it's just know that criminal cases, you can get a judge if you want, or you can get a jury. That's your right. Civil cases as well, the same deal. You can select a judge uh, to decide your case, or you can have a jury decide your case. And everywhere else, you've got to have a judge.